Hi, everybody. I'm John Horgan. I'm director of the Center for Science Writings at Stevens Institute of Technology, and welcome uh, to our first event of 2024. So I'm a science writer. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time now, and I'm often asked, what's the biggest unsolved mystery in science? I used to say the origin of the universe. Why is there something rather than nothing? But at some point I started saying that the bigger, biggest mystery is consciousness, because without consciousness, there might as well be nothing. I just ran that line by my students, uh, by students in one of my classes the other day, and they were kind of looking at me blankly like, what the hell does that mean? Without consciousness, there might as well be nothing. Physicists used to ignore consciousness, but no longer. Many physicists now recognize that if you don't understand consciousness, you really don't understand nature. But how did consciousness arise in the universe? How does matter generate minds? Philosophers call this the mind-body problem. George Musser, our speaker today, has written a wonderful, profound book about physicists' attempt to solve the mind-body problem. It's called putting ourselves back in the equation, why physicists are studying human consciousness and AI to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Here's my copy right here. I actually have two copies. I've got uh, down galleys that I marked up when I was, uh, when I was uh, originally writing a review of the book. Then I got this from your publisher. George is the ideal author for this book. After doing graduate work in planetary science at Cornell, and you're also, uh, I think, a math and EE major at Brown before that, uh, he became an award-winning physics writer. He has written many articles for Scientific American, where he used to be a staff writer, and other publications. And he wrote one of my favorite books on quantum mechanics, Spooky Action at a Distance, which we were just talking about. I highly recommend George's new book. Here's what the Wall Street Journal says about it. Quote, the point of popular science is to get a sense of what's at stake. What kinds of answers are being offered to difficult, difficult questions and why it all matters. On all three counts, Musser delivers, unquote. George is not only a fellow science writer whose work I greatly admire, he's also a friend. So I'm thrilled that he's speaking to us today. By the way, if you have questions for George, so he's gonna talk for a while, but then also leave time for a Q and A at the end. If you have questions, please submit those uh, via chat at any time during his talk. All right, George, it's, uh, it's all yours. And thanks again for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm an admirer of your work, and I'm excited to talk about some of these developments. Physics and consciousness, it's two big words, bigger put together, and I can't hope to even touch on all the questions that it raises, let alone the answers that might be brought in. So I'm just going to kind of carve out part of that and, and discuss a few of the individual uh, issues that I've encountered in my own thinking on this. Okay, John, I will rely on you to step in if my audio or video somehow aren't, aren't working properly. But um, what I'm fascinated by kind of at a, a larger level is kind of interdisciplinary work. Right now, we live in a pretty exciting time in terms of developments in AI, also in neuroscience, in philosophy of mind, and in fundamental physics. And I'm fascinated by how these fields can come together to solve problems of mutual interest to them. Academia, as we all know, tends to be siloed, but there's a lot of creativity to be had at these, these junction points of disciplines. And I will focus on, again, one corner of that, which is the role of physics, how physics can help other fields and how maybe more surprisingly, those other fields can help physics. So let me start by talking a bit about how physics is helping AI, because that's kind of the topic of the moment. And then I'll spend maybe 10 minutes on that and then 
the bulk of my remarks will be on the reverse direction. AI itself is a highly interdisciplinary topic. It merges almost every academic department from literary theory to psychology to computer science and indeed to physics as well. Neuroscience, by the way, I can had put it in the middle of this star. It too is a highly inter interdisciplinary science. The very concept of neuroscience or the very term neuroscience was invented, I think, in the 70s precisely as a way to bridge these disciplines. Sometimes physics seems like the odd man out, out, odd person out here. What is physics kind of doing in this mix here? And one message uh, today I'd like to leave you with is the role that physics has played and continues to play in the development of, of AI. So AI, maybe more than many technologies and more academic disciplines has a kind of a boom bust nature to it. So AI termed as such in the 1950s, had a flowering in the 50s and 60s, and then fell into what's now called the first AI winter. This plot is one measure of that. I think it actually shows the citations of, or the invocations of the term perceptron, which is a type of neural network over time. So it kind of rose, fell, and then later rose again. So in the, if you look in the year 1980, there's kind of a trough in thinking about AI. And it was, physicists who pushed with, with, with other groups as well, but physicists were the primary impetus who pushed AI out of its, its doldrums and created a flowering in the 80s of thinking about AI. And I've had the privilege of interviewing over the past several years, some of the principals involved in that kind of flowering. And then going to the right, there's a new flowering of AI that goes back about 10 years, deep learning that again, physicists have been involved in, albeit in a somewhat different capacity. So John Hopfield, the left here, I spent a lot of time with him when I was visitor of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton some years back. He's actually, this is actually a picture of him in his house. I went there and I actually took a model neural network, physical hardware neural network I had built. Uh, he's kind of holding it in the box. And he, in, in early 1980s, invented a new type of neural network that essentially is, is a type of generative neural network is one of the first in that category that's now, of course, such a huge part of, of AI research. And he's older than Joe Biden and his memory is still very good and he's still an active researcher. I've also talked to Lenka Zetoparova. In the middle here, she was born in what was then Czechoslovakia and is now a researcher in Switzerland. And she applies ideas from different types of collective systems, glasses, crystals, magnets, to understand neural networks. And the word neural implies brain-like, but neural networks, and that's it's something of a misnomer, neural networks are as much inspired by the systems of physics as they are by those, those of biology. Neural networks are a bit of a black box, and one of the roles that physicists are playing today is to try to open the black box, make sense of these networks. And on the right here is Haim Sompolinsky in Israel. And he was one of the co-founders of the field of computational neuroscience. He was actually greatly inspired by Hopfield's work, was a physicist in the same specialty as Hopfield, and then basically now does neuroscience, but does it from a physics -y and a com computational perspective. So I'm gonna give you a sense of why physics is important to neuroscience and maybe will inspire people here to apply their own expertise to thinking about issues in AI and I'll describe that. And then we'll get back to how AI can help physics. Here is your kind of archetypal neural network, a type of neural network, in this case, a feed forward network that takes as shown here, but it can be used in different forms, image data from the left, processes it through multiple layers, stages of processing. And then in this case produces perhaps a label of that image or some kind of compressed form of the image on the right. A, a, a system like GPT has roughly the same structure or arch general architecture as well, though then the layers are, are different in detail. Now, what's interesting is that you can think of physics systems as networks too. So magnets, gases, crystals can also be thought of as units, basic units that interact in a network like structure. So you can then take some of the tools, methods that physicists have developed over 
century and a half to study those systems and bring them back into neural networks and understand how neural networks work in a way that wouldn't occur to a computational a computer scientist or a neuroscientist even. So physics brings kind of its own perspective to that. And one technique physics uses when confronted with ginormous systems, billions of particles, is to take what we call thermodynamic limit. Imagine infinitely many particles or other entities. And you can do that with neural networks as well. You can imagine that these layers in the neural network are infinitely big. And there's kind of a simplicity that comes in when you do that. And Google has a nice animation. They took a finite neural network and they imagine growing the neural network bigger and bigger and bigger until it was actually infinitely wide in this case. And to the right is kind of the landscape of solutions of the neural network. And you can see the neural network will generate or, or represent. And you can see as the neural network grows to infinite size, it's simplified. And by the end, by this infinite size, you get basically kind of a bell curve, multi-dimensional, but essentially a bell curve. And this has been one of the ways that, in this case, a group of physicists at Google have used to understand neural networks. And it's indicative of the kind of research that physics is doing there. Okay, that was my plug for physics helping AI, and there's multiple ways that can handle but I want to spend the rest of my time talking about going the other way. How can AI, neuroscience, philosophy, mind, those kinds of fields, again, highly interdisciplinary, help physics? And to motivate that, I want to back up and talk about what I see as a common theme in many of the problems, puzzles, paradoxes, even that today's contemporary kind of foundational physics faces. And I, for lack of a better term, I call it the inside-outside problem. It's basically the problem of observer. It's a problem of the objective. There's different words that people use, but there wasn't an overarching term for it. I call it the inside-outside problem. And that is basically connecting the objective description that physics traditionally gives us of the world with the experience of an embedded observer. It need not be a conscious observer, although that actually heightens the problem when there is a conscious observer involved. But there's generally a problem in science, physical science, of relating these two types of description. There's the view from nowhere, or, as, you, as it were, or the view from outside the universe, idealized view that no mortal will achieve, with the view that actually the mortal, we mortals do have, which is the inside view of the universe. The Blind Spot of Science, and there's an upcoming book by Adam Frank, Marcelo Weiser, Evan Thompson, by that title, that talks about this lack that, that science has of understanding what's happening from within the universe. And this comes out in a number of contexts, and I will just touch in a minute on one, or maybe if I have time, a couple of them. And the problem of quantum measurement understanding quantum mechanics, the problem, various problems of time, what is causation, what is free will, which is kind of a subset of the problem of causation. There's a number of problems that come up in cosmology, understanding how an observer in cosmology views the, the universe and the biases, the, the lens through which we view the universe can color how we view it. There's all sorts of interesting problems in personal identity, kind of our continuity of our own identity over time. And then there's the one that John trailed at the beginning, which is the hard problem of consciousness, understanding how a, a physical description of the world could give rise to subjective experience. Those, those two seem incommensurate. They, it, people argue, David Chalmers, among, among many, uh, actually goes, the problem goes back hundreds of years at the very least, of bridging the, the two sides. So it's, it's perhaps the most sharp inside-outside problem. I actually won't get into that too much. We can talk about it a bit more in questions if you're interested. So the hope is that the various puzzles that each of these different subdomains involves, I'll, I'll talk about quantum measurement in a second as an example of that, that the puzzles it brings up can be ameliorated, understood at least, maybe dissolve, and that's asking a lot, but certainly we can bring a sharper understanding to them by trying to articulate the relationship between inside 
view that we have of the universe and the outside view that physics traditionally seeks. Okay, let's get into the issues of quantum physics. And this really comes out of textbook quantum physics. Um, there'll be ways that we think about going beyond textbook, but let's start with what the, the textbooks, uh, going really going back to the 1930s, have been telling us about the nature of the quantum world. And one way to frame this, there's actually multiple ways. In fact, quantum mechanics itself has multiple formulations. I'm gonna kind of couch my comments in terms of one of those, what we call the Schrodinger picture, but there are other pictures as well. The problem equally applies to all of them. I'm gonna couch it as kind of a tension between two things that our theories are telling us and really our observations are telling us, different types of observations. Some indicate that the world is particle-like, that there are discrete units or that have specific determinate properties, charge, mass, et cetera, positions. And there's also a wave-like nature that comes out in other types of experiments and certainly in our, physical, in our theoretical description. And the question is how to bridge the gap between the particle and the wave. I should say that there's nothing weird inherently about particles. There's nothing weird inherently about waves. It's the junction of the two that is causing the trouble for us. And I'm gonna work through now an example of what I mean. And that example is gonna be based on an element in quantum optics or optics generally actually, but used in quantum experiments known as a beam splitter. In my book, I actually talk about a half silvered mirror and it's the same idea. You know, those mirrors you see in police uh, uh, procedural shows where, or, or if you've been to like a, um, an interview and you're standing behind a glass and the person can't see you, but you can see them, the half silvered mirror, it's actually bas basically the same thing. It splits light into two. So you fire a weight and oh, actually a wave of light, a laser, for example, and the beam splitter is actually two of them in this image. Each beam splitter splits the light that's in impinging on it into one pat, one beam of light or one sub beam of light that goes straight and one maybe that's reflected off in this case. And then you have a couple other mirrors and then you have a second beam splitter, which is actually gonna play a crucial part in our thinking on this in a second. Second beam splitter, if you actually adjust the path lengths correctly here, will reunite the two beams and create a beam coming out the right. So beam splitters. It actually on an optical bench looks like a little tiny prism or looks like a little mirror. Um, I played with, with this in laboratories. It's actually, it's actually kind of cool. So what's interesting in quantum physics is that you can take and or consider, I should say, individual particles. So not only can you have a beam of light, you can have just one particle of light, a photon, and fire it. And the theory tells you that it too both reflects off and they're going to the right, uh, excuse me, going up in this, in this particular diagram and off to the right, and then reunites in the second beam splitter. Even though, it's a, in, even though it's a particle that's supposed to be indivisible, the theory says actually, in a sense, it goes both ways. And that is what is sometimes called a superposition. It's basically like Schrodinger's cat. In this case, it's the photon version of Schrodinger's cat. Instead of a dead and alive cat, we have an up and a right moving particle. And that is its kind of puzzle of this merger of the particle and, and wave worlds is how a particle can have this wave-like property of, in this case, going both up and to the right. And that, that's what makes quantum mechanics special. So just let me, um, a number of people here are experts, but if you're not, or it's useful for experts to, to think about this, to think about one way to read this experiment is actually turns out not to be right, but it's useful to kind of think about. And that is to imagine that the particle actually really goes one way or the other. So for instance, you might imagine particle really, in this case, bounces off the mirror. It doesn't really go both ways, but somehow our theoretical description fails to capture that, that reality. And maybe sometimes at random the particle goes through and then out to right. So you can think of the beam as acting like a, a door that swings and sometimes it lets the particle go through and sometimes the particle rebounds off. 
And quantum theory tells us that's not the way to look at it, but not just quantum theory, our experiment. And that's where the second beam splitter actually comes in handy because if the particle really chose one way or the other, you might get a situation like that where it comes out the top. And we don't actually observe that if you, again, you tune the, the, the length, you tune this instrument correctly. You only ever see it coming out the right. And that is one of the ways we know that actually there is this kind of bizarre Schrodinger cat-like behavior of this particle. All right. I spent a lot of time, or I spent some time at least, but it's all interesting. You can actually put a dissertation on these beam splitters and the kind of puzzles they, they raise. But now I want to apply, move to the next stage and actually use this beam splitter in an experiment. So there it is. I put the beam splitter on a lab bench. And I'm going to conduct an experiment. And I'm going to think through, rather, what it means to conduct that experiment. And this is something that John Boyne Neumann introduced in his, actually, it was the first textbook on quantum mechanics. So any experiment is a chain of operations. And you would apply quantum mechanics to the various stages or the various links in the chain. So draw your laser. It splits the beam. And you have detectors. On, by the way, you're seeing my pointer move, John? Yes. Good. So I'm not just pointing in, into, the, into the ether here. It actually is a pointer moving. So you fire your laser, the beam splitter, which I've shown here is like a little cube, and it has two exits from, the, from that device, from that element. And then you put a detector at each point, and you wire the detector into a computer. And then there's an experimenter looking at the screen to see what the result was. And of course, this is idealized. And in practice, you wouldn't look at a single outcome like this. You'd look at billions of them over a course of, of some time interval. But OK, this is the, the basic idea of how one of these experiments is done. And they're actually really cool to see. They're really kind of fun and kind of steampunky to, to, to watch it. So here's what's kind of peculiar. And this is what the wave theory, the wave aspect of quantum mechanics is telling you is that each point in this or each link in this chain of, 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 of uh, the, in the measurement process is itself wave-like. So if you've got the particle going both ways by this beam splitter, that means both detectors are actually firing and sending their respective signals to the computer. And the computer is displaying both A and B to the observer. Okay, but here's the strange thing. The observer doesn't see that. We don't see mutually incompatible outcomes in our, in our experiments. We see the particle went one way or the other. We see, in this case, A. The observer sees one of the two options presented to her. And that is kind of, the observer, in other words, is kind of breaking the chain here. We have a series of measurements that preserve the superposition quality of this kind of multiplicity of options until it gets to the observer, until it gets, in fact, not just the observer, because the optic nerve, the visual cortex, all the biological, neurological parts of the observer would actually work this through. They too are going into the superposition state. So it's really in the conscious apprehension of the observer. The conscious mind is the only place known, and it's, it's kind of weird, known to science. It's the only place we absolutely know that this chain terminates and the, a single outcome is obtained. And that's ultimately this mystery or this puzzle, actually the mystery maybe is the right word, of quantum theory. So von Neumann explained this or maybe uh, described it as there being two rules in quantum, the, the quantum mechanics. There is a, a wave behavior of systems, not just particles, by the way, anything. As I said, it was the detector, the computer uh, as well. The, the, they go into this kind of wave-like state that are, the superposition is an, is an example of that. But when the conscious observer enters the picture, and it does need to be conscious observer, even von Neumann argued that, and it was argued also subsequently, is there's a collapse. One of the many options representing by the wave in the previous experiment, it was 
go left or go right or go A, go B. One of those two options is single out. We call that a collapse or a reduction. This is how observers enter or seem to enter into physics, into quantum physics. Now, for I should say for most practical applications of the theory, if you're calculating the spectrum of a hydrogen or hydrogen-like atom, you can kind of get around this by placing the point of collapse in a place that doesn't affect your, your analysis. But for foundational questions, for understanding the way the universe is, this is just a huge problem. It's still an unsolved problem. Einstein actually recognized inklings of this problem actually very early on, long before there was even that theory of quantum mechanics. He kind of recognized a tension between a particle and a wave perspective, I think it was 1909, but certainly very early on. And then it became more developed later. Now, one of the many problems with this is you have to understand what is a measurement? What is a measurer? That's because you're asking the intervention of a measurement or measurer is causing this collapse. And you, you don't even know what that is. The theory doesn't tell you. So at the very least, you have to fill in what that means. Now, it's a common intuition. And again, probably for government work, it's probably fine, right? It's probably fine to think that size is the determining factor here. So the particle is small, the observer is big, certainly the apparatus in between also is macroscopic. So you might imagine that when the particle interacts with a macroscopic system, a small thing interacts with a big one, that causes the collapse. That's somehow implicated in, in the collapse. Now, again, for practical purposes, probably fine, but it's definitely not right for foundational purposes. That's just not what quantum mechanics says. Quantum theory has no size threshold in it. There's no point at which it, the theory says, aha, you exceed this point and you've, you've collapsed down. That's, that's exactly the problem we're trying to address. And I, I, let me just use this as an opportunity to, to make a point that I think it gets lost. Quantum mechanics was developed as a theory of, well, initially really photons or atoms. It, it became described as a theory of small things. Even today, you see that as a common shorthand for quantum mechanics is the theory of small things. But it's not. Quantum mechanics is the theory of all things. It's had no size limit, at least the theory as we've, we've established it now. Maybe it will turn out, and, if, and in fact, in a second, I'll describe how it might have a size limit. But as it stands, this theory has no size limit. Hence, we're faced with this problem. You behave quantum mechanically. The universe behaves quantum mechanically. We may not be able to see that for reasons that are unclear, um, but the behavior is there. And that's, that's the problem. This is the whole point, by the way, of the Schrodinger cat experiment. It wasn't to create uh, morbid experiments about, about house pets. It was actually to make the point that if you can couple a small thing to a large thing and thereby put the large thing in the same condition as the small thing and, and create this, this whole problem. All right. There are broadly, and I'm assimilating a lot into these two categories, but broadly two ways to get at this understand the measurement problem, and both involve an understanding of the observer. Both involve kind of a sharper definition of what this inside-outside problem is. Oh, I should say maybe there's three here. The, the third would just be to ignore the problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore the ignores, because I actually do think this is a problem, but <coughs> probably for practical purposes, you're, you can ignore it. But when you're dealing with foundational topics, you can't. So the first is somehow quantum theory needs to be modified in a way that actually does give observers a physical effect. And often this is thought to be kind of a mystical idea. How can the mind have this kind of supernatural view of the world for decades? This, this really, that's what this, this idea was really typecast as. There's the mystical effect that our minds have on the physical systems. And therefore this possibility can just be ruled out without even further exploration. I, I think now uh, we can we can kind of move beyond that. I think there are ways to phrase there are ways to phrase this, not every way, but are ways to phrase this in a way that's completely rigorous and, and scientific. And the basic idea is that there's some new physics, something not captured by quantum physics or indeed maybe by any of our theories, and that somehow the intervention of the observer 
exposes the system to that new physics. So one way to think about this, maybe even the prototypical way, the first innovative way was something called the GRW mechanism. And that's, it proposes that there is collapse, there are collapses of the wave function and there's some maybe noise in the universe of unknown origins, or maybe there's some instability in the wave function of unknown origins. It doesn't really matter what the origin is that we're going to bracket that problem and just ask what the implications would be. And the implications are as follows. The noise is very muted. A single particle isn't affected by it, at least not for hundreds of millions of years, perhaps, but there's a multiplier effect. When you have hundreds of millions of particles or, or billions or trillions, this, this, this effect actually can become significant. So what happens is through this von Neumann chain, the observer is linked to the particle. In this particular experiment, actually the particle is absorbed by the detector, but you can imagine the particle is preserved and the observer is linked to, to the particle. And the observer is susceptible to noise by virtue of the observer being a macroscopic system. And through this kind of linkage, there's a backflow out to the particle and it causes the particle to collapse. So this is a way that the observer, not through any mystical implications, but just through the interactions the observer has with the particle can cause the particle to collapse. This is tantamount to saying that quantum mechanics is not a complete theory. It's got this additional noise in it that can bring about this collapse. And there's a variant of this due to Roger Penrose that's actually quite well known, maybe the best known variant of this approach. He thinks the noise or, or the instability is attributed to gravitational effects due to quantum gravity or maybe whatever comes past quantum gravity. Um, and that's, that's one approach. You can actually begin to ask, why would the observer have this? Is it the observer's size or maybe something else about the observer? So there's actually now an approach that looks at consciousness. And this is where the neuroscience can kind of help. There's a theory of consciousness known as integrated information theory. There may or may not be right. I'm not going to judge it for that. I'm just going to know one point the theory is making, and that is our brains involve loops, feedback loops. There's all sorts of interconnections in our brain. And up at the top left here is we have a network that lacks this feedback loop and the theory would call it unconscious. And down in these other cases, there are these loops, the theory would say it's conscious. The theory would then say that these loopy networks that we might have in our brains are somehow implicated in exposing the particle. Again, it's not known how, but it's a supposition to this new physics that caused the particle to collapse. And it, it's a testable hypothesis and indeed is, is being tested. I had the privilege, I didn't go to Antarctica as John did, but I did go to Grand Sasso laboratory just a couple months ago in, in the beginning of December and saw that here I am in the middle with two of the physicists working on this experiment behind them to look for these collapses due to <coughs> Gravitational effects are just due to you know, a spontaneous effect. And they haven't seen any. They've looked and they've looked and they've looked and they've got billions of particles and they've looked over actually quite a long time and they see no such effect. So no, this, this, this approach to solving the measurement problem promising, but just hasn't gone through yet. So that means we should maybe think about the other approach that I, I thought about or that people thought about, I thought about it, but certainly a science community has thought about for several decades. And that is that quantum theory doesn't need to be modified, but we do need to modify what we think of as the observer and what we think of as an observation. And this line of thinking goes back to Hugh Everett in the 1950s. Now, Hugh Everett's ideas are often labeled the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. This idea that there's multiple universes, we have access to one of those universes, but others are out there. And science fiction, of course, loves this. There are problems with the idea of multiple universes, but maybe it's an answer to this. But I wanna back up and, and look at what you ever actually originally said, because I think the theory, his, his ideas were somewhat mis misconstrued. Maybe universes, do split and branch and we have this kind of parallel universe structure that is so beloved of science fiction 
But his original insight had nothing to do with parallel universes. It had to do with understanding the argument for wave function collapse. And the argument is similar to that given for the Copernican revolution. So the question is, <coughs> we don't see the earth, uh, let, me, let me back up. You look at the sky and you see the sun rise and set. It seems to be going around you. The moon, the stars, planets, they seem to be going around you. It certainly looks to you like you're at the center of the universe. Now, Copernicus's great insight that led to inverting this whole picture and setting modern cosmology in its current path was to realize, wait a minute, suppose we weren't at the center of the universe, we were, were stuck to a planet orbiting, in his case, the sun, we would still think we're at the center of the universe. We would still see planets, sun, moon, stars appear to go around us. His point was you need to be very careful about your first impressions. It will always look to you like you're the center of the universe, even if you're not. And Hugh Everett's the elaboration on that was it will always seem to you that you cause a collapse of the wave function, even if you don't. So you can't take collapse or the appearance of collapse as an indication there really is a collapse. This was his central insight. So let's go back and, and work through what that means. Again, our von Neumann chain, laser, splitter, both detectors fire, computer registers both outcomes. Observer registers both outcomes, both of them. Now the observer is only aware consciously of one of those, those outcomes. But how do we gain, and this is argu the argument that I ever gave, how do we know we're not seeing both arguments? What kind of introspection do we ability do we have? And we humans are terrible at that kind of thing. We have very bad ability to gain perspective on ourselves and effort was suggesting this actually comes into our very basic observations of the world. That the observer herself in this case could be in a superposition and not know it. Only someone looking in to her can know that she is in a superposition. She thinks she's not, in this case, it's him. The observer outside thinks that she is. So, and one way to put it is, and the way I like to frame it, is that collapse is an inside phenomenon. It's a product of being inside a system. Whereas wave behavior is something seen from the outside only. This is a very powerful solution to the measurement problem doesn't add any quantum mechanics, uh, mathematic, uh, additional mathematics to quantum mechanics. It just requires that we think carefully about what it means to observe. And there are issues with, with, with this approach as well. There's kind of a, a self-negated quality to it. It's kind of weird that the observer doesn't have this ability to introspect and realize that she is seeing multiple outcomes. She, she thinks she sees A only when she's actually seeing A and B. So that's kind of weird. And this is actually why the theory developed into a theory of multiple universes was to try to make sense of why she's so unaware of her own state of affairs. And that's, I'm not gonna get into multiple universes because that's just a, a whole rabbit hole I don't wanna go down. We can talk about that in Q and A if you, if you really want. Another issue is that these two observers, the one outside the lab and the one inside the lab doing the actual experiment, have very divergent views of what this experiment is saying. One sees a collapse the inside and one doesn't see a collapse the outside. And so that means truth, our truth, our understanding of physical systems is observer dependent. This kind of goes under the rubric of what is called a perspectival view of quantum theory. And there's other ways that this perspectival view has been, has been developed, but multiple universes is one way and there's other many actually many other ways that this has been developed so that's a little disconcerting we're used to not being objective truth in politics god knows but now even physics lacks an objective truth okay for lack of time and i really want to get to q a i'm going to skip over two other examples of the inside outside problem 
One has to do with the understanding of time. Time itself seems to be the product of the inside view of the universe. The universe itself seems to be timeless, and yet we experience time. That's another example. And I can come back to this maybe after uh, the meeting generally disperses. If you're really interested, I'm happy to show these slides again and walk through the argument um, offline with you or just individually with you for why time is this. Causation also. What's weird is that the universe considered in its entirety as a, as a closed system doesn't really have a sense of cause and effect. The kind of nature of cause and effect just doesn't apply to a closed system such as the universe. You have to have an open system or universe that's subdivided into multiple open systems before cause and effect gain their meaning. This, that's, an, that's a critique that goes back to Bertrand Russell and other philosophers. And so again, causation is to be, seems to be an inside view versus an outside causeless view. Basic point I want to try to make here is, oops, is that we have this inside outside problem. We have this problem of merging the inside and outside views of, of the universe. And this is, I'm just representing what I see out there in science. These, these ideas aren't original to me. In fact, they really go back. I mentioned to Copernicus, they at least go back to, to then, but Immanuel Kant was also very influential in, in making these kinds of arguments. And a lot of the founders of quantum mechanics made them too, I've listed two here. And a lot of people today are making these arguments that we have an inside outside problem. We have this need to merge the interior and the exterior perspectives if we're going to make sense of some of these outstanding problems that science has. It's often said, John, you've been one to say that physics is in a crisis today. And I, I think it's, it's on, the, on the cusp of, of it's, it's got a lot of puzzles that we don't seem to know our way forward. And I think we're, that's a, almost a good situation to be in. I'd rather be in a situation of, of pregnant possibility than of determinate answer. So it's, it's interesting to see how this thing on the inside outside problem will push physics to the next level. And thank you very much for your attention. If you were in a uh, auditorium at Stevens, there'd be a huge round of applause for you, George. Uh, thank you very much. I could ask you a lot of questions. I'm assuming that some people out there have questions. Remember, you can uh, submit via chat. I just wanna pick up on that last thing you said about the crisis in physics. Here's the question I have for you. Um, do you see all this work so, and, and you just gave a, a, you just talked about um, a subset of the many different ideas about uh, coming out of physics um, and consciousness related uh, research uh, in your talk right now. So I, I really do, uh, which I loved. I mean, I, I, you, you gave people a, a, a taste of what's going on uh, but there's a lot more going on in this book, some of which seems contradictory to me. I mean, there, there are ideas that I'd say um, are mutually exclusive. So the question I have is, um, and this is what uh, a question that uh, I wrestled with uh, as a result of my own study of quantum mechanics over the last couple of years. Will there be a convergence at some point? Is there, do you personally believe that there is a correct way of resolving the measurement problem and understanding uh, quantum mechanics, interpreting it, however you wanna put it, that will also possibly help us understand how consciousness fits into the physical universe. So we will sort of know, yeah, this is the answer. Do you think that's going to happen? As opposed to all this diversity, all this creativity, this ferment. Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But I, I do think my intuition is, and I'm gonna, brack, I'm gonna footnote that and come back to in a second, but my intuition is that there is an answer and that we humans, perhaps in conjunction with AI, and the different modes of thinking AI are giving us will 
converge on that answer. So I do think there's an answer. Probably if I were, you know, back against the wall and had to speculate, which you're putting me, of course, is that it will involve a successor theory. We're going to have to go deeper. Now, I, as you mentioned, I was a, a math major, dual major in, in college. As actually at the time I wanted to do cryptography. That's why I got interested in mathematics, although I eventually didn't do that. And one thing that always struck me about studying math is I never really understood a course until I took its next course. So I didn't really understand AP calculus until I took vector calculus in college. And I never really understood that until I understood. I never understood ODEs, but ordinary differential equations until I took partial differential equations. I was like mentally one behind. And maybe that was just me, but I also think science is a bit like that. We, to understand something, we need to know what's deeper than it. And so I think probably we'll need a, uh, at the very least, some kind of unification of uh, relativity with quantum field theory, general relativity with quantum field theory, in order to get at some of these foundational questions in quantum mechanics. That may even, even that may not do it, but I think we'll probably need something. And that was actually Roger Penrose's intuition, is that we need a successor theory to understand our, our current theories. But going back to my footnote, I do think that there, another possibility is that at least some of the different interpretations are alternative ways of viewing the same situation, maybe in either different limits or even different types of experiments or, or different uh, places that we apply our theories to, and that there's value in many worlds interpretation. There's also value in a Bohmian approach, which actually on reflection is similar in some ways to many worlds interpretation. And we can triangulate in on um, what's happening, maybe in a way that we can't articulate what's happening yet, but we can bracket it by looking at these different interpretations. And maybe consciousness is, I think probably all the theories of consciousness we currently have are going to be deemed wrong eventually, but maybe they're nibbling around it. Maybe they each has captured some essential ingredient. Maybe the feedback loops of IIT are indeed important to consciousness. Maybe it comes on short-term memory as another theory is so important to consciousness. So each theory is going to latched on, you know, like feeling a part of the elephant latched onto something about consciousness. And, and thus you might go down the other puzzles. I love your optimism, George. Um, all right. Uh, what Somebody has a question that I was going to ask you anyway. Um, yeah. This is from David Collini. How do you believe quantum computers will affect AI and building off that, how do traditional organisms, animals use quantum science? Um, I'm just gonna generalize that a little bit and, and ask you whether you think quantum computation, which is undergoing a, a kind of boom right now, um, might affect these questions that you're interested in. Yeah, so, I mean, there's different ways to think about an, uh, an effect it might have. And one is just the computational power of quantum computers on certain types of problems. They're not generally um, going to solve every problem blazingly fast, but there are certain types of, of problems that they have particular purchase on. And actually, AI or, or machine learning neural networks, shall we say, actually happen to fall in that category. So I think we'll, we'll see the application of quantum computing to neural network uh, training and, and running in particular, because there's the, the kind of matrix mathematics needed for neural networks is very similar to that needed for, for quantum for quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So I think we're, we're definitely going to see, um, I, th I think the best way to think of quantum computing is currently we have GPUs in computers, even phones, graphical processing units. I think we'll, 10 years, you know, some part uh it's within our uh horizon but not tomorrow we'll have qpus we'll have quantum processing units to which the machine will offload the factorization problems this kind of search and maybe some of these matrix operations uh quantum biology a huge field i just wrote an article for new scientists uh, actually touching on this do organisms make use of quantum, or I should say distinctively quantum effects. They obviously make use of quantum effects in a, in a general sense because the world is quantum, but do they make use of some of the very distinctive 
properties of quantum mechanics, such as quantum entanglement, quantum superpositions, uh, quantum coherence generally. And I think it's, it's it, I mean, work, work needs to be done, but yes, there do seem to be some places where um, certain, certain photosynthetic molecules, not all, not chlorophyll, but some, some do make, seem to make use of quantum coherence at least, maybe bird navigation. And the one, um, and this is, goes back to kind of my, my gotten a bit earlier in my remarks about interpretations. I'm a let a thousand flowers bloom kind of person in my thinking. I, I like the, I'm the person who goes to the restaurant who likes to order the buffet. I like sampling a lot of different things. And I think that theories that prove to be wrong can still have value. And I think the whole idea that quantum effects are important in consciousness is an example of that. In the search for quantum effects in the brain, people are researchers, experimenters are seeing hints of quantum effects in the brain. They may not be full up consciousness, but it may be responsible for other functions within the brain. And it's important to, in apropos of this question, to realize that biology has been subject to intense optimization pressures for, well, multicellular organisms for hundreds of millions of years, biology in general for billions. So if the quantum effects can help biology, it stands to reason biology may have stumbled on them or may have taken advantage of them. They may not be what some of the theories say, but theories are often just a spur to the experimenters that they, they theorists will suggest something, experimenters go out, look for something. They don't find that thing, but they find something else. And that's how science gets pushed forward. Um, so a couple of uh, colleagues of mine have asked questions. Uh, one is, uh, this is from a distinguished historian of science, James McClellan. How does AI apply to the inside outside problem? Yeah, so I kind of uh, brushed over that a little bit, didn't I? So I think that the combined, the, the kind of approach to uh, the brain. George, can I, let me Sorry. let me make let me put a point on that. Um, I one question I have is, how would you know if there is an inside? To the AI. In other words, how do you know that a, 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 like a neural network made of silicon is conscious, has a first person experience? Uh, so it, uh, this uh, famous neuroscientist, Christoph Koch, K-O-C-H, has proposed that uh, might be possible to build a consciousness meter. You could point it at the at the neural net and it would the needle would swing over showing that it's conscious. So yeah. This seems to be a fundamental problem in making a science out of conscious. You can't really be sure that things are are conscious. So what about that issue? Yeah, and you're right to frame it as a fundamental problem. It's a problem that affects all theories of, of consciousness is that testability is, it's not clear what a test would be. Right now, we test by extrapolation from our own my own experience that I think you, John, are conscious, even though I can't ever directly know that. Um, I, what does it even mean to know that? This is the whole, what is it like to be a bat problem? But I interpret that you are conscious because you, it ticks off every box. We, we share, you know, 99 point whatever of our DNA. We uh, have the essentially the same anatomy, same cultural background, et cetera. Um, and you act in the way that I would act. So it's just kind of a theory of mind um, that you're, it's consistent and that can, okay, you're conscious. And that can kind of begin to radiate outwards. It becomes obviously a lot more problematic the further away you get. I think primates, probably other mammals, it, 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 that, that kind of extrapolation works. And beyond that, hard to say, including um, AIs. I think a neuromorphic AI, one that was deliberately expressly built to model brain anatomy and physiology, again, by virtue of this extrapolation argument, probably we would ascribe consciousness to that if it also showed the behavior of it. But what about chat GPT? It's, it's hard to know. Um, it passes the Turing test. Do we ascribe consciousness 
uh, to it. Um, you, there you, um, you really need a, th a theoretical principle framework. And this is where the various theories of consciousness have an application as it were. Uh, the pure research has an, an application, which is, uh, and when, when we go to assign a credence, do we think chat GPT or GPT-4 is conscious? We need to have some way to make that judgment. We, Jabin Chalmers has done this analysis. He's actually taken I don't know, five or six theories of consciousness, applied it to GPT-4. GPT-4 doesn't seem to have any of the essential features that those theories uh, involve, um, such as GPT-4 does not have feedback loops. It has transformer layers, which provide some of the functionality of feedback. That's kind of historically how the transformer arose in, in AI research, but it's not feedback. It's a feed forward system. So chat GPT or GPT-4, I keep going and saying that, probably not conscious, but you can't, we're gotten to a point where the behavior of these systems, the, the out text output in the case of chat GPT is so good that you need to go to the next level in your thinking. You need to have a principled explanation for human consciousness that then you can then apply to the machine systems. Yeah. Um, all right, we're all we're almost at an hour, but I, I'm I'm if you want to keep going, uh, I'm happy to stay here as long as people want, and as people trickle out and those remaining want me to go back in some of the slides, I can do that too. But I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm happy to take more questions. Okay, I know I don't know if he's still here, but uh, Tom Clark, uh, who is a uh, somebody who I think it's fair to say is, uh, has very strong feelings about free will. He was in the audience earlier. And so I have to ask, and I'm, I, I have pretty strong feelings about free will myself. Uh, so um, what are your thoughts about all, all of your research? Where, where has it left you as far as free will goes? Okay, I do have a kind of compatibilist leanings on free will, but before we, debate the question, is there free will or not? We can, we can ask, what are the kinds of questions and answers we need? What kind of knowledge or understanding do we need to develop to make progress on free will? Or answering the, the question of whether we can be said to have free will, what that would even would mean, or maybe how do we understand our own perception that we have free will? So I think there's a, and this is often neglected, and this is why I want to make this point, is I think there's a conceptual underpinning that needs to be developed before we can even hazard a, a guess. So for instance, when people have arguments over healthcare systems, and that comes up in politics, it helps to have an understanding of how the healthcare system works. And I guarantee you not one person in 100 actually understands how health insurance works. It's extremely complicated. And then, we, of course, we go off and we make build huge arguments over her. Should we have single payer or, 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 or whatever? We're not even understanding healthcare. Same thing goes here. We have these intense arguments. Dan Dennett and Sam Harris go at it. Is there free will or not? And what is that? Without kind of this underpinning. Okay. One underpinning is we need to understand causation because causation comes up in the domain of free will. It comes up in sense we, we think we have mental causation that what happens in our mental representations in our minds has some exterior effect. It's not merely epiphenomenal. So we need to understand causation. Free will arguments of someone who denies that there's free will, doesn't think there's free will, um, we'll say, well, there's no free will and it will point to physics because all the causation occurs at the base layer of reality. And conversely, someone like me who's a compatibilist and says there is free will would say, no, there's an emergent notion of causation. In both cases, we're invoking causation. What's causation? So I actually have a chapter in the book where I try to pick this apart. There's a lot of thinking, very interesting thinking about what causation is. What does it mean to cause something coming out not of physics, by the way, coming out really from computer science, coming out of what's known in, under various terms, but as an interventionist view of causation that's very influential. It's dissolving all sorts of questions in statistics, um, in biomedicine. And I think those insights can be brought into the free will argument as well. 
So bef- I'm not going to answer, is there free will or not? I've actually I've kind of answered it. I've sent out a compatible list. But before we even go there, we need to know what we're talking about. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really sensible answer. You'd make a great moderator for a debate about free will because you could point out when people are sort of talking past each other uh, on both sides. All right, there's a... Uh, there's a really interesting question about the Chinese room experiment. I think that's, I'm sorry, that's a little bit too inside baseball. Uh, maybe we can get into that. I wanted to ask you a question or just bring up something that I find really fascinating about both your books. So Spooky Action, which you were talking about before, which came out, in, I think, in 2015, and your new book, you end with wild theorizing going beyond space and time, talking about a reality that precedes, that gives rise to space and time. I'm assuming that to understand these models, you have to understand the mathematics. It's certainly way beyond my ken. Um, But then this raises questions about what it even means to have an understanding of some of these issues when we're going beyond the sort of basic infrastructure of our of the human condition you know space and time i think most people sort of take for granted that's part of reality no there's something deeper so just i'm just bringing this up because i find it so fascinating i any comments you have on that i'd appreciate yeah so space and time uh, and that's related to causality, of course. Absolutely late related, and to, especially to uh, to time, the time side of that. Um, but let me um, what's what what's something I can say uh, about this? One, the question I try to answer toward the end of the present book is whether the problems of hard problem, the various problems associated with unifying physics and the other puzzles are beyond us. There's a, there's a view that maybe we're just not smart enough or we're too tiny creatures. We have too little access to the universe, very selective access at that. Maybe we just can never understand consciousness or the deep nature of time or, or space. And as you said earlier, I tend to be an optimist. I think in science, you kind of have to be, frankly. Um, otherwise, you're just going to go off and find some better paying job, right? I mean, why would you sit around throwing new ideas in the trash can all day? Because you know it, it, it's like that. So I think one framing of some of these problems is that they do involve going beyond space. Our thinking is shaped by, it's essentially spatial. Probably in evolutionary terms, a lot of our cognition sits on top of our ability to navigate, to locate, to imagine in our mind's eye things. We actually literally put ideas in different places in a sense, and our our thinking is spatial. And consciousness by its very nature doesn't seem to be spatial. It's, 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 it's not involving, at least not in a clear way, interactions, causal interactions within some kind of space-time venue. I think that's probably why it's hard for us. So we need to transcend our spatial thinking in order to understand consciousness. But by the way, we need to understand, transcend our spatial thinking to understand space, actually, because space may not be fundamental. So I think in that sense, there's a linkage of these kinds of problems that we're going to need some new theoretical framework to get at these various deep questions. I think it's going to be crossover. um, And we know there are inklings within different theories of quantum gravity, different approaches to quantum gravity of transcending a spatial framework. And those theories, space is in some way or other derivative uh, from some deeper degrees of freedom, be it strings or, or whatever. And so space is ultimately uh, ultimately derivative, and in understanding that, we may also be able to apply that to these other non-spatial considerations. And this is, again, I'm speculating a little bit here, but I get to do that toward the end of my book. <laughs> well, then, uh, so my follow-up question, this is, I, and I think I sort of alluded to this earlier, what does it mean, let's say we have such a theory? I mean, so, you know, you go back to the, the heyday of string theory, 
And uh, the true believers thought that string theory was going to be this ultimate theory that um, that generates space and time and energy and matter and all those things. And it would be some kind of beautiful, um, highly symmetrical geometric thing. And, uh, and the problem is that there might be like a handful of people in the world who kind of understand the mathematics involved in that thing. So what happened to Einstein's vision of theories that should ultimately be explainable to anybody. Um, yeah. Is it possible that we might find a, this this deep theory that that uh, somehow tells us about the origins of space and time and consciousness and matter and all that, but that it really won't make any sense to any ordinary untrained people? Yeah, no, I, I think the goal of science should be comprehensible explanation. And as you say, that's been the tradition in, in natural philosophy and in physics. Now, again, hard to make predictions about the future. Um, I, obviously, people want that for consciousness, unification, all the many other questions that we face. Uh, and th that's their entire methodology is to, to get that. I do see it as being a logical possibility that there will be no easily digestible uh, explanation that the explanation will be held maybe collectively that no one person can access it, but maybe a group of people can, or maybe, um, and this is something I've been thinking about lately and actually wrote, you know, wrote an article for Scientific American on global workspace theory. The idea being that our consciousness has a limited capacity in it and that helps us to streamline our explanations, but maybe it doesn't have work. Maybe we need to relax that and an AI not subject to our biological restrictions will be able to relax it. It'll have a somewhat wider window of memory. It will be able to make linkages that are too complex for we, us to make. So maybe an AI will, will be able to apprehend that theory in a way that an individual person can't. Again, I'm, I'm speculating. Um, but then that would be, a, that, if, if that's the case, that would be a kind of a, a stepping stone. That AI then maybe could explain it to us and maybe we could develop ultimately that deeper understanding. All right. So I feel like we've sort of entered the just shooting the shit in the bar after the lecture is over uh, stage. And but there's still some people here listening. And I, I'm I like I, I love talking to you about this kind of stuff. So I've got I've got another question. And um, I guess it has to do with the the hope of some scientists that they might discover meaning at the bottom of everything. Uh, so Stephen Hawking famously had this phrase that when we have the final theory um, that will help us know the mind of God. I think that was a joke because Hawking was an atheist. Um, but there's some people who took that very seriously. Uh, Steve Weinberg, this other uh, great physicist, said that the more we understand the universe, the more pointless it seems. So I just wonder what your personal feelings are on whether when we get, let's say we get this final theory that you're sort of glimpsing possibly over the horizon there, will it, will it say anything about why we're here? Will it give us any sense of meaning or purpose? Yeah, it's, it's a good, good question. Obviously, impossible to know with an absence of such a theory. Um, I think it. My inclination is that it will provide a partial answer to that. I think that it will, and this is why we do cosmology and why we do physics. I think why we really do it is to understand why the universe is as it is, and I think it would help our kind of worldview, it would help in a very global sense in how we think to, to know. Just as, as um, it, you know, most of us will never go higher than a commercial airplane flight, but knowing the universe is out there, knowing there are other planets, probably other planets that are inhabited, certainly of diversity of worlds in our own solar system, I think knowing that does filter in some way to my everyday life. It, maybe it's diffuse, but it's there. Knowing that 
the earth is not the center of the universe or the bottom of the universe is actually really how they thought of it. The kind of sump of the universe. The universe is, earth is, um, stands as equals with the other planets. I think that helps in a, you know, doesn't put food on the table, but it helps in kind of a general sense, um, give us a purpose and meaning. So I think it's going to be some benefit from that. And that's why we really do pure science. That's one of the main reasons, arguably for me, it's the main reason why we do pure science is to kind of know things. And that there's obviously other practical benefits it has as well. That said, I think a lot of what gets put under the umbrella term purpose, meaning is determined its convention. So it, it's a kind of life we collectively want to lead. Um, it's historically contingent. So the value we place on, on a life, I don't think that's wired in, into the universe in any deep level. How could it be? But it's it obviously essential to our own functioning. So I think we ultimately construct our, our own meaning, but it, we do it in a way that's informed by the way the universe is. Uh, I should probably end there because that, that was a that was a great response to my question. But I've got a I've got a follow up, and let's just make this the. Uh, and I do see some it. chat. I haven't actually been keeping up with the chat. I'm going to let you filter that for me. Yeah. If there's any other you, questions, yeah, I've been giving you the. Uh, okay. Good. The good, good ones. Um, so, as a follow up to that question, it seems to me that short of I don't know discovering God at the end of at the end of physics, uh, whatever that would mean. That it would be pretty extraordinary if we came up with a, th a theory um, that somehow made consciousness intrinsic to re reality. Uh, so you know, you already have some theories, integrated information theory. There are other versions of this. I think even the Penrose theory uh, suggests that. Consciousness isn't just this um, late product of uh, evolution of one kind of species here on Earth. Uh, uh, consciousness might be built into the fabric of the universe. It was there from the Big Bang <laughs> onward. And that would be, it seems to me, um, pretty, I think we could feel pretty good about that. I just wonder what your thoughts on whether panpsychism might actually be true. Well, it might be true. It does tick off a number of boxes for desiderata in a theory of consciousness. Um, it does seem to solve the hard problem, though it in turn introduces its own kind of mirror image of the hard problem. But the, I mean, it would be pretty mind blowing if we were to conclude through either a conceptual understanding and or some kind of some kind of experiment that consciousness were so pervasive or ubiquitous in the universe, or in some sense, the universe as a whole is the only conscious being and where fragments are, are kind of images of that. Um, Philip Goff obviously has, has written extensively on, on this question. Let me just make one remark about it. And that is, I'm not sure it would solve the problem of meaning. I still think, I still hold to my earlier point that meaning will be ultimately mostly constructed by, by us and it will be constructed differently um, by different beings in, in the universe. And that should be informed by the way the universe is, et cetera. And that will also be true of panpsychism. Now, panpsychism has often traditionally been coupled with a, a romantic both small and capital R view of the world, that there's four spirits or there's, it would be amazing. It would be wondrous that consciousness were scattered everywhere. Um, you would walk among the beings every time you took a stroll. I mean, you, you, um, I have a book by David Abrams somewhere here that kind of fleshes out this view. It's very popular in environmental movement, for example, and very influential in that movement as well. But I think there's a dark side to that as well. And that is privacy. There's no such thing as privacy in such a world. Most of those um, minds are atomized. They're inaccessible. They're, they're just on their own. 
it's kind of a, almost a scary, it reminds me of a Star Trek episode where they, uh, they're on this planet and it's just packed, like core people are packed like subway cars everywhere. And it would feel like that. It would be this kind of this somewhat disturbing view of reality. So I think even a view of consciousness and of physics, you know, and panpsychism can really marries the two, that has this um, view doesn't automatically have the moral and ethical implications you might think it would. So I think probably even in such a world, we would have to construct our own um, sense of meaning. But I'm, I'm really just riffing off the idea right now. Yeah, uh, no, I... I... I like that. I, I I think your ambivalence about it is uh, is appropriate. Um, all right. So there's still some uh, people hanging on here, but I'm thinking. I mean, unless you want to scroll through uh, chat and look for something to answer, I'd say we should um, we should wrap it up now. How are yeah, you I mean, I, I can I can address a few of these comments. I mean, I don't want to keep anybody here. If you okay. need to go, that's cool. You just go. Uh, no, and John, I'll, I'll, I'll hang around. you need to go, but I, I've got a few comments I can address here. David asks, will we sure. ever be able to use, or do I, do I think, or do I believe we'll be, ever be able to control quantum entanglement to, as a communication tool? And no, I don't think we will. And I think that's for deep reasons having to do with what entanglement means. Um, and there's two kind of ways to, to address that. One is the randomness or the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics is really essential to entanglement. So when you have entangled particles and you measure them individually, they give random answers individually. You can't control the answer they'll give. That's part of the indeterminism of quantum theory. It'll be the same. It was like flipping a coin here and flipping a coin there. You'll get the same outcome of the toss, but because of your inability to control the outcome, you can't use it as a communications device. And I think that's probably not a, a small hurdle. I think that's probably inherent to what entanglement is. I think it's just inherently beyond um, application. Uh, in communications, there's only one even vaguely plausible approach I've seen to that, and that is um, it basically a, in the Bohmian mechanic view, you can imagine, and it's, it's a long technical discussion, but basically we in, in the Bohmian view are at equilibrium similar to thermal equilibrium. And if there were a disequilibrium, the Bohmian uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, the Bohmian mechanics would allow faster than light communication. But that's the only case I've seen that that um, would work. Okay, Chinese room. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about the Chinese room that my, my own, I take a kind of systems view of the Chinese room. I think the system, the, the, to the extent that the room is conscious, if it indeed is conscious, and that's unclear, it would be conscious as a, as a, as a system rather than as the person in the room turning the cards or, or looking things up in a book or whatever the um, scenario of the Chinese room. And by the way, this is for non-Chinese speakers or non-Chinese readers would, would be. Um, but this, the, the system view is not without its own difficulties um, because it kind of punts on the question, is indeed the room conscious? And in some theories of consciousness, the ability to perform a function does not entail consciousness. You have to look at the structure of how the functions perform. IIT is an exa one example, but other theories do this as well. So you do need to kind of look in how the functions performed. So it's unclear whether the Chinese room would meet th those criteria for consciousness. But it's not obviously unconscious, as, as Searle, I think, originally intended. Um, and there's a bunch of other questions. I think I'll probably take them from the top. Hume, too. Yes, David Hume. Um, Bertrand Russell. In fact, in my original remarks, I, I gave credit, uh, props to all of them. How does AI apply to the inside-outside problem? And here, I think there's a couple ways. I think mostly AI helps with the inside-outside problem at the theoretical level. That by understanding consciousness or observers, which may or may not be conscious, to understand the observer, to get that level of understanding will help us with the inside-outside problem. How do we get the level of understanding? We bring in multiple fields, including AI. So AI would be a, a theoretical tool here. 
there, I should say there are more direct approaches um, that actually try to conceptualize the universe as literally a neural network. And then there's a more, kind of more immediate direct relevance of AI to inside outside problem. Um, I, I actually mentioned those very briefly in my book. I don't, I think they're kind of cool, but they need to be developed. More work is needed here. A lot of computers. I don't know what the Maharishi effect is. I, I didn't know that. So I didn't, I didn't. So um, that's what, that's if Clayton is here, um, please. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, oh, I, I think did I hit all of them there. Yeah, I've been sort of paraphrasing some of these questions um, yeah, yeah. as they appeared. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should call it quits there. Yep. And I'm happy to um, talk with anyone here offline. I mean, you can email, message John, and you can yeah. be my conduit. And I can interact with, I'm happy to answer questions, engage in dialogue on these questions. I think it's fascinating. I think we're really at a, and this is maybe my concluding remark, we're really kind of at a, every era thinks it's special, right? But our era is special in the sense of we're having this convergence of these multiple disciplines. Every era is special in some other sense, but this is our kind of claim to specialness is a lot of these questions in physics that have been punted for really since the origin of physics with Galileo, Descartes, et cetera, yeah. um, they can't be bracketed anymore. They can't be punted anymore. They, someone has to catch them. And now we're at the point where we need to catch that, that ball that Galileo punted. And that's, it's, it's cool. It's cool. And I think there's just a lot of interesting work that's going to be done. And young people, I think will be, will be heading that up. It's a great time for science journalism, I must say. Because it's like the wild west out there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a couple other uh two one questions to go over time and causation. I'm happy to do that for anyone who would like to stay on. I can just give you the quick, like five minute version. And so give me a second here and recap integrated information theory. Um let's see, maybe I should take integrated information theory first. Um there's a lot to be said on that, and you have to read my book. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to say, to add to what I, the nice things I said about your book in the very beginning, to those who are still out there, one of the remarkable things about reading George's book for me was that he's talking about a lot of things that I've written about myself and that I thought I understood really well. And in every single case, integrated information theory is an example. I saw it in a new light as a result of um, reading George. He brought out aspects that hadn't been clear to me uh, and puzzles with the theory uh, that I hadn't appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I, I imbibed the theory. I spent a lot of time talking to Giulio Tononi, Larissa Albantakis, others in their lab, others who are kind of more on the, you know, elsewhere, on this theory. And I have my own view on the theory that actually is non-canonical. It wouldn't be one that Tononi would necessarily, um, I mean, he would say it's right, but he would say, this isn't the way I would put it. And I think the theory zeroes in on the unity of experience. And that it, when we introspect our conscious experience uh, isn't subdivided, at least not in an obvious way. That's in, in the way that it's, if it isn't subdivided, it's sub, in, subdivided in a kind of sub-psychological level that we don't have access to. Just our manifest experience is unified. I, the sights, the sounds, even uh, within the category of sights and sounds, the different aspects of them are unified. I, don't, I see color and shape together. I don't see kind of the, an object have a color over here and a shape over here, they're, they're connected. And this unity of consciousness has, was recognized by Descartes. I mean, it, it, it probably by philosophers before him as well as, as being highly significant. And IIT really runs with that. Now, Julio phrases and frames IIT in terms of axioms. <clears throat> and there's multiple other axioms, but this is my own entry into the theory is I really focus on this unity. And his kind of postulate is that the unity of our experience 
reflects the unity of physical structure or really of the workings of physical structure. And that's a hypothesis. Um, there's probably no way to really prove it, at least not directly. It's one of these things where you have to work the implications of it and try to test those implications. But as a hypothesis, it's just a hypothesis because essentially to really solve it, you need to solve the hard problem. And what he's trying to do is basically just put the hard problem over here and let's just make this hypothesis that links the mental and the, and the physical together, namely that there's unity and there's unity. And the way it's formulated more deeply is in terms of neural networks, basically. And this is one way, by going back to the earlier question, that AI can inform the inside-outside problem. AI sets at least the current paradigm of AI with neural networks, this kind of connectionist view, is, is the paradigm. It's, it's really the, what we mean by a paradigm in the Kuhnian sense. It's, it's creating the, the basis of discussions of things. So we can build this theory in that paradigm. So here I've shown on the screen a simple five element net neural network network and with different degrees of connections among them and increasing degrees of connection. So up here, we've got kind of, oh, it was mostly connected, but it's missing this final link. So it's really just a one way network, no loop. IIT would say this is disconnected. It has this, this value phi is associated with it. It just reflects the degree of integration. It's not unified. Therefore, it cannot be a uh, cognitive consciousness. And then you kind of stare at that up. Maybe part of the network is unified, or maybe um, it's pretty unified, but not 100% unified. Then there's like this ultimate unity where every network uh, node connects to every other network node, even to itself. And the degree of unity of the kind of physical system here is associated with the degree of unity of the experience that the physical system is said to be having or thought to be having, the brain is ha having, or maybe the AI system is having. And one thing that's interesting and what this particular diagram is attempting to show is there's kind of a, a Goldilocks effect where you want there to be some unity, like these two middle cases, but not none and not too much. If, you, if it's completely, if it doesn't have, any loops at all, then it, and it doesn't behave as a unified system. Um, that is just a lack of unity altogether. But the problem over here with this completely unified system is there's just not much information in it. So although it's unified, it's behaving as kind of a monolith. There's no differentiation that can occur within it. You don't get kind of an interesting group dynamic uh, in this kind of highly integrated network. And you can do all sorts of fascinating things built on this kind of intuition. Um, one, you can quantify it. And that's actually kind of why physicists got super interested in, in, in this theory, both as advocates and as detractors, is that there's kind of a quantification. You can put a number to things. That's always, uh, physicists always love that. Um, you can also, and this is actually something, John, you alluded to earlier, you can also use this in basically a clinical application. You can actually use this intuition to build instruments, to to build an, an, an essentially a consciousness meter. And actually I had this done to myself when I visited uh, Tononi's lab at Wisconsin, I guess it was two years ago. It was after, I was gonna go before the pandemic. I was actually gonna go March when the pandemic lockdown happened and I had to defer the trip two plus years, but I eventually went there. They put this thing up against my head. Um, it's a magnetic stimulation. And then they watched the EEG and they're able to ascertain that my brain basically was like this network over here. It was highly connected, but not too connected. Um, so therefore, it said, George, you are conscious. And I was quite relieved to know that. So it, it's a cool theory. It has a lot of interesting elements. It has some cr critics as well. Um, but I think it's been a fruitful theory, if only because it's created this consciousness meter that doctors can now use with comatose patients. If that's the only contribution it's made, it has been good for humanity to have this theory. And probably it's introduced other principles that an ultimate theory of consciousness will have. I think this looping is going to be important. Um, and by the way, it talked a lot about causation. Causation is kind of an important part of this. I think causation is also going to be an element in the final or the, the a more developed theory of consciousness. Okay. Let me pause for a moment to see whether- uh, George, I do helped. have to go down.
Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bow out. I'm gonna try to. Okay. I, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm worried. I'm not gonna shut it down. At least I. My you know, intention. Why don't we is call this shut it, David? Down. You're the one who asked about time and causation. Why don't you email me, John? If you could be the intermediary. David, email John. Okay. John, you email yeah. him, and David, I will Jay show Horgan. you just one on one. Jay Horgan at stevens.edu. Jay Horgan at stevens.edu. My email is also on my personal website. That's a that's a different email, but I'm very easy to find. Yep. And David, I'm happy to work or anybody else, email that same place and I will bore you uh, or interest you in time and causation. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye now. George, thank you so much. This is the longest. This is the only time um we've had a q a last this long so this is it's been a pleasure and thanks everyone for staying it's really been fun all right bye everybody thanks for uh hanging in there too bye talk soon George.